For this Insight Lecture, Part 2, please grab your anatomy atlas. You're going to need it. If we're still trying to figure out what's inside our human package, we need to review all of the methods used by early physicians who did not have the luxury of x-rays in the diagnosis and or the treatment of their patients. They used their eyes, inspection, their hands, palpation and percussion, and their ears, auscultation. Today, we do the same before exposing our patients to radiation. Interestingly, even though we still call it the radiology department in most hospitals, many of the imaging modalities do not rely on radiation. An example is the MRI scanner. The MRI scanner, previously called the NMR scanner, i.e. nuclear magnetic resonance scanner, relies on magnetism and proton spin to form an image. The strength of a magnet is measured in teslas. The average magnet strength is about three teslas. The name was changed from NMR imaging to MRI imaging in fear the public would boycott the technology if the word nuclear was used to describe the technique. The technology is the same technology you used in organic chemistry to break down the structure of molecules via their proton spins. Of course, in addition to MRI spectroscopy, ultrasonography is another imaging technique that does not rely on radiation either. In Insight Lecture Number 1, we were reviewing auscultation. Let's continue. Let's listen to our human package with our ears or with our stethoscopes. Perhaps even more importantly, we can just listen to our patient talk to us as they tell us what's wrong. It's often said the most important part of the patient's history and physical examination is taking a good medical history. Simply, this means to listen to your patient. Don't listen to interrupt him or her. Listen to understand. If we listen, they will likely lead us to the diagnosis. But what if they don't? Thankfully, we have radiology as one of our options. If we use our stethoscope and listen to our patient's lungs, we can hear lung sounds and a variety of different lung sounds leads us to different diagnoses. Please click on each of the highlighted links to learn about a variety of physical examination techniques used by physicians before the advent of radiological imaging modalities to diagnose their patients. Some of these are ingenious. Remember, some of them also sound silly to us today. but you will not always be practicing where you'll have the most modern technology and radiological interventions. You may someday need agophony or whispered pectoriloquy. Thankfully, in 20 years of my surgical practice, I never needed any of these techniques, even in rural Arizona. But you might be in a place that is far from rural Arizona, and these techniques might come in handy. Boxes come in all sizes, colors, shapes, flavors, sizes, and volumes. So do our patients. Palpation is the art of touching our patients in a clinical manner, allowing us to explore the body's different internal organs or explore the body's external surfaces. We use palpation to try to feel the size of the liver or feel the spleen or to reduce a hernia. You'll learn more about hernias in the neuromusculoskeletal course. Of course, we can also perform percussion on our patient. We spoke about percussion in Insight Lecture Number 1. It's the sound guiding us to a proper diagnosis as we tap our way around the patient. After we have exhausted all the techniques used by our own senses, i.e. inspection, auscultation, palpation, and percussion, now we begin to use radiological techniques available to us beginning from the simple to the most complex. Perhaps the simplest radiological intervention is a plain chest x-ray. Here's an image of a plain chest x-ray. In this chest x-ray, the patient, obviously female, we can see ribs, lungs, heart, diaphragm, the clavicles, i.e. the collarbones, the scapula, and other anatomical structures. What else can you see? I can see the trachea, bronchi, the carina, and the thoracolumbar vertebra. If you don't recognize any of these terms that I've just mentioned, break open your anatomy atlas and take a look. 
Another simple radiological test is the abdominal film. This is a particular film consisting of a radiograph from just above the diaphragm to inferior to the pubic symphysis. The image shown here is an abdominal film and next to it on the left is a KUB. KUB stands for kidneys, ureters, and bladder. It's a little different than the abdominal film in that the KUB does not extend quite as far cephalad, i.e. towards the head, as an abdominal film, and the intent is to try to image the kidneys, the ureters, and the bladder. The image on the left shows the pelvis of the kidneys, the ureters, and the bladder containing iodine containing contrast. A real and normal KUB will not contain contrast. Keep this in mind as we move through the course and you move through your first year of medical school. An abdominal film and a KUB use about the same amount of radiation, but there's subtle differences in what anatomy or body region is actually imaged. Here a plain x-ray of the feet and a plain x-ray of the wrist bones is also demonstrated. You'll need your anatomy atlas now. Can you name the wrist bones and match them to the respective image on this radiograph? Can you name the bones in the feet? The ankle. Can you see all of the bones in the ankle? Which ones can you see? Which ones can you not see? Is the patient wearing shoes? Do you see any fractures? Are the films appropriately exposed for your liking? This radiograph was taken of an elderly patient. He slipped and fell onto his pruning shears while he was working in the garden. Click the link below and watch the short video that occurred at Tucson's University Medical Center. Other than the wow, that's amazing effect, what information can you get from this radiograph? How do you think it guided the surgeons in removing the pruning shears from this gentleman's face? We mentioned pneumoencephalography previously. Here are two images demonstrating this, now defunct technique. Grab your anatomy atlas and look up choroid plexus. Can you see the choroid plexus in this pneumoencephalogram? What else can you make out? What else can you see? What bones can you see? Are there any fractures? Are there any other abnormalities that you might be able to make out? Take a look at your anatomy atlas and let it lead you through some of the basic anatomy of this now defunct technique. Examples of mammograms are shown. The mammogram on the far left is a digital mammogram, while the mammogram second from left is an analog plain film mammogram. The films on the upper right are 3D digital mammograms, while those in the lower right are also 3D digital mammograms. The plain two-dimensional mammograms, shown second from the left, are still quite useful today despite the other advances in technology. They are still the most commonly used and, in a way, you've just viewed your first cross-section of human anatomy. Lymphangiography has, for the most part, been relegated to history. This radiological imaging modality was used to assess lymph nodes in patients who had infection or cancer like lymphoma, edema and swelling of an unclear cause or vascular disease. Side effects of lymphoangiography include deep venous thrombosis, i.e. a blood clot in the leg, or infection from the procedure itself. Lymphangiography is rarely used today. Sentinel lymph node imaging is used every day in the diagnosis and treatment of breast cancer. The image on the far left explains the technique. Blue dye, lymphazurin or methylene blue, is injected around a tumor. The dye is then adsorbed into the lymphatic channel surrounding the tumor or the cancer. The procedure is often done first by injecting not only a blue dye, but a radioactive chemical, usually technetium, and then the patient is sent for radiological imaging. The image obtained by, quote, viewing, end quote, the radioactive area of the breast is called lymphocentigraphy. These images show how the blue dye progresses in the lymphatic channel and eventually a lymph node is stained blue. This blue node is called the sentinel lymph node. As the image shows, the sentinel node is the first node draining a chain of lymph nodes or receiving cancer cells from a tumor. 
It stands at attention, like a sentinel in the military guarding a fort. He's the first lymph node to receive any bullets, or in this case, cancer cells, from the tumor as the cancer attempts to spread throughout the body. This is called metastases. Sometimes the blue dye is not absorbed and the clinician must rely on the radioactivity which was injected. In the operating room, the surgeon will use a Geiger counter to find the sentinel node. The Geiger counter is used to follow the radioactive lymphatics until a lymph node is found with the highest radioactive count. This is the sentinel node. It is removed and sent for pathological inspection to see if it contains cancer cells. If it does, it's a sign that the cancer has attempted and may be successful in metastasizing throughout the rest of the body. Both techniques, i.e. the injection of the blue dye and the injection of radioactive technesium, are complementary, often used on the same patient in the same operation in the same event or in case one of these methods fails to demonstrate the sentinel node. Before we go into more complex radiographs, I'd like you to understand some of the history of radiology. Please watch the associated videos. Here we see two of the first images taken using x-rays. The radiograph on the hand on the right was taken by Dr. Rentgen, whereas the foot x-ray seen through the shoe was taken by Nikola Tesla. Today, the name Tesla has become synonymous with the automobile. But that wasn't always the case. Nikola Tesla is responsible for most of our modern technology, and it's safe to say that while many of you have heard of the name Tesla, most of you have never heard of Nikola Tesla. Tesla is given credit for inventing remote control, industrializing alternating current, inventing radio, and the discovery of x-rays in the late 1800s. Nikola Tesla was born in 1856 and died penniless in 1943. But Tesla is giving credit for a multitude of discoveries. However, most of us in our youth were taught that x-rays were discovered by Rentgen, whose picture appears on the right. It took the United States Supreme Court to decide Tesla was the actual discoverer of radio. A gentleman named Marconi was given credit for having discovered radio. But a review of the patents had shown that he actually used many of Nikola Tesla's patents, and the decision was overturned, giving Nikola Tesla credit for inventing radio. Remember that the next time you crank up the FM dial. It took the United States Supreme Court to sort this out. So who really discovered x-rays? Who really discovered radio? Was it Tesla or Marconi? I ask you to remember these names, not to torture you, but because they're important to the modern practice of medicine. Many surgical operations, instruments, measuring units, among automobiles and even rock groups with the name Tesla, are named after these early pioneers in physics. We mentioned fluoroscopy in Insight Lecture 1. Now, let's take a closer look at how it's actually used. These three short video clips are referenced here to give you an example of how fluoroscopy can be used. Bugs Bunny knew how to use it on the Tasmanian Devil, if you remember Taz, but today's modern equipment, like that shown here, is used for a variety of imaging techniques. The patient can stand on the table while the table is rotated upwards to a standing position or flat at an angle parallel to the floor. We're getting closer to discussing more complex radiographic techniques used in medicine. In Insight Lecture 3, We'll give more examples of radiographic techniques used in the diagnosis of our patients. Learning the names of these techniques will help us to establish the language of medicine as you move through your first year. Thank you for listening. Let's review and ask some simple review questions. Number one, who's Nikola Tesla? Number two, who is Rentgen? Number three, who is given credit for discovering x-rays? Number four, who is given credit for discovering radio? Number five, what is a sentinel lymph node? Number six, what is lymphangiography? What is lymphocentigraphy and how do they differ? Number seven, what are the complications of lymphocentigraphy? Number eight, what are the four techniques we use to perform physical examination on our patients? 
Number nine, can you name all of the wrist bones and identify them on an x-ray? Number 10, can you name the ankle bones and identify them on an x-ray? Number 11, what is lymphazurin and what is it used for?